18 years mm -hmm. this year, longer with uh, other substances than alcohol. Um, but these are only, there are many valid takes on this complicated issue and subject besides mine, such as definitions of bad habits versus addictions. I won't be debating those, but I'm just going to be stating my lived history. If you have another ex a unique experience with, re with regard to addiction and kind of what it is, um, we can bring it up and talk about it. But we're, I'm not going to be saying, mm, this way or that way, that kind of business. Um, <clears throat> this is just going to be a general description of what addiction is, what acts are like, and how they get that way and how we recover. Um, what is addiction? Addiction is. Um, According to AA and sort of my lived experience, is a spiritual problem that is manifest as a chemical dependency that people use to just feel normal. It's a coping mechanism to cope with life's problems and life's difficulties, how you feel about yourself, things that happen to you and your family, any number of things. It leads to a loss of control, and it can take over your life, or it does take over your life. It kind of has to be an addiction. Addicts cannot stop on their own, even though most want to. Most addicts are beset by problems not unlike those of other psychosocial problems, such as uh, manic depression, depression, um, other uh, uh, bipolar disorders, all of which can be medically treated, but addiction largely cannot. You can give an alcoholic an abuse to make them sick when they drink, but there's no pill that will stop you from being an addict. The urge to use is, is used to cover over feelings of, and feelings that you have in your mind and trauma that you've experienced in your past. And it is learned behavior, which we treat spiritually because it is the only method besides a, um, shock or aversion therapy treatment that is known to arrest the disease. Um, and some think there is a genetic component to addiction, because it does tend to run in families. Um, it runs in my family. Um, but there's two sides to that familial business. What runs in families often is trauma. Mom was, you know, depressed a lot. Mom was abusive. Um, so the children <coughs> learn and aren't loved, and they tend to be abusive when their mothers, that kind of thing. So there's, there's behaviors that, that run in families, as well as genetics that run in families, that some people believe um, causes, or can be a cause of addiction. Um, but those are all learned behavior, and they're not genetic. Um, what we do about it is kind of how addiction gets started. Um, 12-step and self-help recovery is the most known and practiced method to arrest the addiction. 12-step um, was uh, founded by um, a stockbroker and a doctor. And the doctor was sick and tired of a lot of drunks coming in, and there's nothing that they could do with them except put them in asylum. So it was in the 1930s that this was happening. And so they, they learned you know, mostly about how to talk about your problems and how to um, sort of get through, you know, learn to express your problems to other drugs to help you understand what's going on and how other people may have stopped um, drinking. So AA is, was one of the first ones um, that uh, was the first 12-step program. Um, there are many other form, there are many other um, paths, there are many other flavors of AA. So there's NA for narcotics and pot. There's CA for cocaine. There's OA for overeating. Um, there's SA for sex, too much uh, people who are compulsively have sex. Um, there's probably a few others that I can't quite think of. They used to have MA for marijuana anonymous. Um, there's also Al Anon. Um, Al Anon is 12 step for the families of addicts. Because having an addict in your life, as some of you may know, um, can be very traumatic and can cause you to take on a lot of feelings of uh, difficulty and it helps you deal and cope with addiction in your family that um, 
is not that it's active and is not being arrested. So uh, let's see. So all, I, I should start with the anonymity pledge and what they, you know, what um, was mentioned about me and my being outspoken about my AA, about my addiction. So um, Alcoholics Anonymous is anonymous for a couple of important reasons. The anonymity is um, serves two functions. Um, a lot of um, addicts um, look for, most addicts look for excuses not to get better. So any reason they can think of not to have to deal with their problem is used as a way to, well, I don't need to do that. And so one big excuse would be, if I go to a meeting, everyone's going to know, and it's going to be too embarrassing. And so uh, if, it's, if, if it wasn't anonymous, a lot of fewer people would, would participate because they would use that as a reason not to show up. Um, the other reason is mostly, um, it, it, it kind of fits in with the last one. It, um, uh, being an addict or being an alcoholic um, has a great deal of social stigma. It had a lot more in the 30s and 40s when this was getting started. You know, being a drunk was you know, akin to being a child molester. I mean, it was really, really bad. And that's why it really was very, very anonymous in the very beginning. That's not so much the case here. Opioids and other addictions that are much more common and much more widespread, it's, there's not as much stigma there, but there still is. I'm sure you'd agree that there still is a fair amount of stigma. So the anonymity is very important that um, it'll, it removes those barriers so people can participate and they can come and be honest. And so, Whenever I speak at an AA meeting, uh, I introduce myself by my first name only. I've been going to AA here four or five times a week for a year, and I don't know anyone's last name in any of the, there's about 50 to 60 AA meetings per week in those um, And so uh, we also um, do not uh, talk outside the rooms about what we hear or what anyone says. Everything is confidential. And we repeat these, uh, these uh, principles in every meeting, so everyone is always reminded of how important anonymity is. And it's, it's, it's a pretty big deal, and it's actually quite uh, strictly adhered to. It's actually amazing. A lot of the principles of AA, a bunch of drugs who are just the most self-important and lying, cheating monsters on the face of the earth, how religious they are about <laughs> some of these principles. And the main reason is because our life is and so, uh, as far as my personal anonymity, I'm allowed to tell people at the public level about myself. But um, how that sort of functions is that it's, it's an honor that it's not your place to tell anyone else about my status, because that's really, it's, it's back to it's my news. It's my business. It's more like gossip in a certain way. Much like if, you know, if uh, someone in your family were to die your friends shouldn't be running around telling everybody that news is not their news. But anonymity is it's a little more strict than that. But it's the same idea. That um, I prefer if you not run around and tell everybody that I'm not drunk. I really probably wouldn't mind, but if you get the idea, if you find out about somebody's status, you should probably just keep it to yourself. Because that allows them to kind of stay where they prefer to stay. And again, it's not their news. So the anonymity is, is, is a real big deal. Um, with uh, um, any questions to start with? I'm going to go through the 12 steps to kind of give you what I want to do is kind of give people an idea of what this is really about because I think a lot of people have heard of AA and they don't really know what it's about though and what really happens and what's going on there. <coughs> And so this is kind of our Ten Commandments. Um, it's actually, I think we probably stick to the Ten Commandments more strictly, or, or the Twelve Steps, <laughs> than you guys might stick to the Ten Commandments. Um, and again, the reason is very clear. And it's a fascinating one about how AA functions versus how church functions. We have a very strong motivation for staying with us. Um, we say, with a lot of experience, 
that there are two or three ends to addiction. Institutions, a lot of people end up being in prison for their lives because of what they've done, they're drunk, or death is, is a very common. And of course, recovery, thank goodness, is, is the other one. The percentages are not good for any of these. Um, but that's a big motivation. We do this to save our life. You can skip the Ten Commandments and still survive. If we don't do this, we die. And we die at a regular rate. It happens often with my friends and my associates in these rooms. We have moments of silence at the beginning of every meeting to remember the people who are not with us anymore. It's a big deal. So I kind of like that as a real big motivation. I prefer not to get to know God, I guess, in a deadly way, <laughs> in a life saving way, but it's a really interesting way to get to know what God is really all about. I'll tell you that. A lot of us say we're glad we, we were drunks because we've learned so much about life, how to live it, who we are, how people function, what, what relationships are all about. What does my self esteem really mean? We get trained on life is what happens. And this is sort of how we start with it. So the first three are a very gentle way to get people to um, sort of begin to ease their way into stopping and, re and, and finding a way to set their life in order. Um, you know, a lot of people, they, they, a lot of people drink, I think, because of abuse problems that they can't handle, things that have gone completely awry in their lives. You come home from work and you just you have a drink every night. And then after a while you're drinking every night, whether or not you had a good night or a bad night. And what happens is you end up having that drink just to feel normal all the time. And you can't actually function unless you have that drink. It's compulsive. You want to stop, but you can't. You start wrecking your life. You can't show up to things. I missed um, the holidays at my family for five or six years because I couldn't get up early enough to get the train to go down. Um, and all different flavors of that kind of thing. I bet most of you know somebody in your family or in your environs who uses um, uh, substances too much. And one way I'd like to maybe have help, help uh, people kind of understand how these steps work is um, <clears throat> As we go through this, um, take that word alcohol and replace it with anything in your life that you do too much or perhaps want to do less of. Social media would be a, a good one, but even things like codependency, your need to control things, worry, fear, doubt, these kind of negative emotions that you might be doing too much. Use that as a method to understand beyond, you know, the idea of like, why would anyone drink too much if it's bad for them? Well, uh, think of what you can kind of put in there better that's more relatable to you. And then keep that in mind as we go through this. Uh, so, you know, the first thing to getting better is um, you have to, you need to admit that you're powerless over alcohol. And a lot of alcoholics, when they get to a point where they run out of options and they try this out, they can see that, that yes, I am powerless. My life is unmanageable. I used to drink every weekend and barely go out and run around and do anything. I barely show up to work on Monday morning by maybe 11 a.m. Some people don't show up until the afternoon. That's pretty unmanageable. You can't show up to work on time. Um, and so once you're in way to admit that you're powerless, that you don't know what to do, and like I said earlier, um, a most genuine addiction, you cannot stop on your own. Um, then you might be able to believe that a power greater than yourself can restore us to sanity. And so this is how we introduce God into the program. Um, there's a lot of difficulty with God because um, many addicts think God let this happen to them. God did this to them. 
a lot of my people, the gay people, um, uh, have been taught by a lot of uh, popular, uh, a lot of the culture that's justified by the church that gay people are awful or, or filled with sin all the time. You can imagine in gay meetings that I've gone to what they think about God. So it's a huge obstacle, but it's absolutely necessary. And we allow people to define God however they wish, especially to start. Because getting to that guy in the sky that a lot of people have a lot of problems with um, ain't going to work for most drunks and we're trying to save your life. So we let you pick a God of your understanding. The idea is it's something that's not you. And so we say good orderly direction. We say um, the people in my meeting are the people that I'm going to trust my life to. And that's essentially what you do anyway. That's how these meetings are. So we allow people to define God how they wish. And you, you, you're going to start to believe that maybe something other than me can help restore my life <coughs> to the life that I want, the life I used to have. And then, you know, we take this real gently, because a lot of people spend a lot of time on the first two, and the first is one of the hardest steps there is. You turn your will and your life over the care of God as we understood God. And so that's that concept. It takes a while for people to get over their, um, their prejudice about the mean God in the sky um, that most, um, you know, Americans are taught about or believe or, or think is, is who God really is. Um, and so they, uh, we let you pick whatever God you want. And what we don't tell you is later on, you're going to learn a lot more about who God is because of what God is going to do for you to make you better. And we have all of our God fans at the end than we did at the beginning. <laughs> Honestly, you know, you guys, I went to a conservative evangelical church when I was in my early teens. And they didn't like my people at all. Uh, so I left there and went to San Francisco and had a lot more fun with my young life. Um, and, and so this taught me who God was. I went to this before I went back to church. Thankfully, because a lot of the Indians are in churches, the nice, friendly churches. <laughs> perhaps then, you know, whatever someone else might tell you. Um, so this is how I learned about who God really is. And then I come down here and I want to bring it all together. So, uh, yeah, so we get you kind of used to God and then you kind of just, it, it, we teach people to let go. We say, let go, let go. We say, stop doing all this stuff in your life. Just let it all be. And then we, uh, we have you sit down with a sponsor Someone who's been through the program before, you sit down with someone that you can work with as your buddy, your chaperone, through the, it's kind of like your, your own pastor in your, in your uh, program. And you do a, program, a moral inventory of yourself. Mostly it's an accounting of the things that you've done in your life that have caused you harm or caused other people harm. It's more complicated than that, but it's a way for people to come to grips with, as a drug, this is what, and it helps people have some clarity about, you'd be surprised the destruction and mayhem that drugs cause that they're completely unaware of, that they blame on everybody else. And I can assure you, every drug believes all their problems are completely up to all of you and not, not them, ever. And you gotta turn that thing around. And boy, that's a hard bus to turn around. But that's what we do at number four. Number five, is um, you, you make the inventory, then you sit down with your sponsor and you go through it and you talk about it and they can reflect back to you. What does this really mean as, a, as an un, uninvolved, unbiased person? Um, they can give you sort of, here's what I think. I did this with my sponsor and I thought all the things I'd done, running around crazy, sitting up all night in San Francisco for five years, um, uh, I thought that was nuts. Fortunately, my sponsor had done a lot worse for a lot longer than I have. So yeah, uh, uh, but he validated my fear, my isolation, my family history. My father died of alcoholism when I was 12. He caused all kinds of mayhem in my family. Um, 
my, my, both of my grandparents on my mother's side were alcoholic. And so I have a kind of compassionless mother who, has a, who never learned how to be really obviously loving to her family because her parents never taught her that. I have an older brother. Um, he's in his late 50s, who's an active alcoholic and has been for 30 years. And he comes into my life from time to time. Um, I have two sisters that are all better fine. They drink and no problem. Um, but, so I had that accounting and I went through and then all of a sudden I realized, well, now I understand what's causing my need to cope with my life with chemicals. And then by that time you kind of realize, well, you know, that's kind of not working. It's not, it's not the right thing to do. I don't want to do that anymore. And then you get into um, six and seven. This is where the healing happens. Um, so you figure out what's wrong. You've kind of got an idea of what, what your life is about. Maybe some ideas about what caused all this. It's all kind of fuzzy too. But usually <coughs> somewhere between four and the end of seven, we get a clarity. Um, some of us call it a pink cloud. Um, but I actually still don't understand how that works. The desire to drink is little. Um, actually, you're not allowed to drink when you go to meetings, so you actually have to stop before the first day. <coughs> that kind of helps. Because <laughs> to <laughs> this one, your altar is, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so right in there, God kind of, through that, the clarity comes in. And most people can't really say when or how, but suddenly they realize, there's, I don't want to do this anymore. And trying to hold on to your life and hold on to the program, it, from the wreckage to the healing is very difficult and very tenuous and very tough. People relapse during this kind of thing all the time. But I, to this day, can't tell you. God did something. And I honestly know it was, it was God. And that's my miracle right there. I haven't taken a drink since, uh, since October 29th, 2001. Um, so, you know, these are these things that I talked about that cause this addiction are what we believe are called defects of character or shortcomings. So all those things I talked about earlier. A lot of it's also abuse, real stuff that happened in your family is not your fault. And the fifth step is when you go through that and you understand and you're brought to terms. It's like meeting with a therapist. They help you understand what those things really mean from someone who wasn't in them. He doesn't have the trauma and can give you the clarity about what that really means. And then eight and nine are what we do now that we're better. Better. Um, we don't cure alcoholism. We arrest the addiction. There is no cure. You're never done. Um, 10, 11, and 12 are lifelong uh, things. You're in this for life. To stay sober, you have to do the first, the last three, or maybe even the last. There's like, you can do lots of steps over and over. But most people do 10, 11, and 12 on the But eight and nine is when you, you you take that list of all the stuff you've done, and you make a list of people you're going to make amends to. So you, um, we, we send people around to the people that have caused trauma to, and you sit down and you, speak, you apologize, and you try and make right anything that you did wrong. People pay back debts of, of things they stole. They go back to that store 10 or 20 years later and try and pay the store back for the stuff they ripped off. They talk to their mom that they haven't talked to in 20 years about the problems that um, in the past where you let your mom down and you did all these things. You talk to exes, um, four flames, all this kind of stuff. And you basically say, look, here's what happened. I'm really sorry. Is there anything I can do to make it up to you? <clears throat> this is a forgiveness that's for you, not for them. Because most of the reactions I like to say are, wow, that's great. I'm so happy for you. But a lot of the reactions are like, 
mm -mm, and I put my finger up there, but you get the idea. A lot of people don't want to hear from you at all about this because you've really burned that person there. And that's fine. We just walk away and say, I tried. And you're not to cause any harm. So you can't do this if you injure them or others. So if you admit to something that causes someone to know something they shouldn't know about a child that someone had that no one knew about, for example, um, you have to stay away from anything that would cause harm. Because the idea is we're trying to make things better here, we're not trying to make them worse. So we don't stir up old and problematic <coughs> things, especially when people who are not involved. Uh, so 10, 11, or 12 are really important. And this is what produces honest, kind of loving, selfless, humble people. We, uh, we have to take inventory of the things we do wrong and admit when we make mistakes. We have to say we're sorry a lot more than we ever have before. This is what we actually have to do in our lives um, what we used to cover up with alcohol. So instead of you know mouthing off at work, getting your boss mad at you, coming home and drinking over it, you actually have to say, I'm really sorry I did that. How can I make it? And you actually do what most normal people would do um, to deal with your problems instead of drinking them. So we do this on a daily basis. Um, a lot of AAs, I would say, um, they get a lot better at not being a oh, self-important, you know, dingleberry. But a lot of them only turn that down like 50%. There's a lot of AAs that are the coolest, most serene people you'd ever meet. And there's some that are still, you know, <laughs> they still got a lot of animus and they've got a lot of, you know, you know, big guy syndrome and stuff. And they still walk around like they've got it all figured out. And they're, they're not the best, but they'll go to an AA meeting often and they'll talk about how awful they really were. And they'll admit to their peers that they were, but they might not do some of that. So it improves their personality quite a bit. I wouldn't say it always makes everybody a whole hundred percent better. Okay. So, um, and then we get into this is the this is the point of the program. Can we get the last line? Whoops. Oh, it's on there. Anyway. So this is where we get to know God a lot better. So once we're through with all that stuff and we've gotten our our mind cleared, our, our life cleared out, we end up with the spiritual awakening. We read these steps in every meeting, you guys. The, the news is clear to everybody, but a lot of people don't realize that the whole point of sobriety is to have a spiritual awakening. It says as the result of these steps. It's not a, it is the main point, is to have a spiritual awakening, to live a life where God is in charge, where you're a contributing member of, of society, you're a humble, giving, and loving person as much as you can be. And so, um, this is kind of the stuff we try and do in church, right? There's a lot of um, And so, the last part of 12 here um, is to carry the message. And so, as a member of AA, I am I'm charged with going to meetings for the rest of my life to share, to do what I'm doing here, but in a more raw manner to tell other people who want to learn how to get better, how that works, and how I did it. So AA meetings are, are left roughly, um, you go in, um, it's a bunch of people around a couple tables. We read the steps. You might have a topic, like serenity, or uh, uh, I don't know, uh, Loved ones that are bought, that are bugging. Some guys having a problem with his girlfriend or something. Might talk about that a little bit. People will talk about um, try, feeling powerless, about um, wondering where God has been in their lives lately. It's it's a whole bunch of different things. We'll go around the room, and other people will give you a reflection about what they did to solve that kind of a problem. When I felt like that, here's what I did. That's what the self help is is your peers are telling you methods to deal with what you have, 
to give you some sensible ideas about what to do about it that you didn't think of. Or in many ways, it's just getting the thing off your chest. People talk about their problems. You know, when you get together with your friends, or you go and see a, um, a, a counselor or someone, just talking about it really helps a lot. And so it's remarkable how much this really gets people. They often, most people hear something they want to hear in every meeting. <coughs> We go around the room, people uh, talk one at a time, there's no crosstalk, so another reason to get a bunch of self-important, um, opinionated and you know, egotistical people to not get into fights all the time, is that we don't allow people to talk back and forth to one another. One person speaks at a time about their experience, and you're not allowed to comment on what you think of what that guy just said, because you can imagine. Um, <laughs> Uh, after drinking, brawls are not a good idea. <laughs> so um, it's actually remarkably effective. It's very um, strictly held to. And I've never, I think one or two meetings I've ever been in in all those years where there's been any kind of a, you know, someone walks out and gets all annoyed. It's remarkably functional. And I often think in some meetings where we're talking about tough subjects, that kind of protocol of those stuff crosstalk would be very uh, effective. Um, <coughs> yeah, again, alcohol makes, only appears in one step. Because this is a spiritual program about addiction. And we like to say that the chemical, the addiction, is actually not the problem. The addiction is the symptom of the problem <coughs> that is causing the coping behavior that is, uh, that is self medicated with the chemical. Mm -hmm. And so we treat the spiritual problem to get you to understand that your life is a mess because um, you've been too self indulgent, because you were treated so badly as a, as a child, because you've always had a shitty self image of yourself. Um, any number of reasons um, that adult addiction, and a lot, of, a lot of folks can probably guess or be led to believe in maybe half the cases of people you know who are addicted, why that would be the case. You know, my father um, immigrated here from East Prussia in 1929, ran around the country with a bunch of women, and then um, ended up in San Jose in Section 8 housing, um, having told his new wife that he has all this money abroad, and basically couldn't keep his job. The timber industry he was in dried up, and all the, all the babies were popping out and couldn't support his family. And so he drank over because he just couldn't cope with the expectations of being a father of four young children. And it was all over his family too. He, he said, oh, we always had wine on the table. And so there's those kinds of things that feed into an uh, attitude of addiction. Um, any questions about some of that? Funny question. Um, I've had two people in my life come to me through this process to <clears throat> do their forgiveness piece. Oh yeah. One was my grandmother, and she wrote a letter. Yeah. And at the bottom of the letter, the last line was, "I wrote you this. I sent you this car because I had to." <laughs> so I was like, "Okay, we're still not actually <laughs> connecting here." <laughs> and the second time, it was my boss, and he. It just seemed a little awkward and a little bit ingenuine. So I'm just saying that out loud because I'm, this is fascinating, but also it, clearly my grandmother was not in recovery at all. And she ended up you know, dying from alcoholism eventually. Yeah, she Even though she had kind of snowed over, as my dad said at that point, you know, she was like, well, I had to say this. And with my boss, I felt a little bit like that too. So is that a common occurrence? Yeah, a lot of folks um, don't do the steps completely. A lot of a lot of how that kind of thing happens is in step four, when you're supposed to go through all the things, they leave things out. They leave out the stuff that bothers them the most. They leave out the things they can't, they can't, they just can't go there. They can't deal with that. Step one is is a version of that. The most common reason for people to stay alcoholic is they just do not have the will to go into all that darkness. There's a reason they drink to cover up. 
All the stuff they're trying to deal with is so awful that even with this direction, even with trying to get God to help you, they just can't go all the way into that. If you, uh, I recommend two TV programs about this thing. Intervention is on A and E. It goes through this stuff. It's very accurate. It's it's a little more raw. On one to ten, uh, mild to um, nutso, raw. I'd say they're about a seven or an eight. So it's more sensationalized than most, but it's very very accurate in my opinion and how it deals with things. And if you watch that, you can see why these people are not able to just get all the way in there and really do the program. The other one is uh, My 600 Pound Life is on TLC. It's the only program on TLC that I can possibly watch. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also extremely accurate to talk about past trauma and things that have happened to people that caused them to overeat for decades. It's fascinating what makes people do this kind of stuff that is clearly ruining their lives and just all the health problems and the rest. It's, it's really, it's really, they don't do 12 step in that. They don't do recovery. They kind of do through psychology, but either one of those are pretty good examples of what I've been talking about. If you don't have